Welcome here, everybody. We're going to have another great episode of the Contractor Business Builder Podcast. My special guest today is Dwayne Barney. He's going to be filling in a, us in on how to figure out the, the map for your business. How are you doing today, Dwayne? <laughs> I'm doing really well. I like the reference to map. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the idea behind uh, your company, Business Blueprint? My background is completely in construction. I have been in the industry my entire life, my entire career, different aspects of it, commercial, residential. I've done some land development, done some flips, you know, whatever I could find to do at the time. And one of the biggest challenges I found in the industry is there's a lot of really good builders out there. And most are as honest as the day is long and will give you the shirt off their back. And that is usually the thing that ruins their business is they love to build. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, I tried that business thing and it didn't really work out. I was like, well, because nobody was running the business. They were too busy building. So my objective now is to try to help as many builders as I possibly can to work on the business side of their business. And many don't even understand what that means. And if they do understand it, they've never done it before. And so they don't even really know where to start. They're kind of cobbling it together, as they say. And uh, I've been there. I've done that. I come from a builder perspective, so I try to do what I can to help them. Right on. Love what you said about, you know, working on your business. If people aren't familiar, you know, what that means. And I think it means a little something different to a lot of different people. Can you can you give us your your definition or your your insight as to what working on the business really means? Well, I, I do focus on that because I do I do like the book E Myth and if that's where you know yeah. it comes from is working on the business. And when I first read it, this was way back in the day with my first business, I was inspired. And then I sat there like a deer in the headlights. I didn't know what it meant. Like, okay, what does this mean work on the business? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? I had no idea what my next steps were. And honestly, I then see guys reading EOS and they're like, hey, I want to crank up and, and do this entrepreneurial operating system. This would be fantastic. But they're not ready because they got stuck somewhere in between E-Myth and EOS and their business isn't ready. And, and they don't understand the goal is to really make the business self-functioning without you. Yeah. And which seems antithesis to everything people think about, hey, I'm starting my own business. I, I run the show. The goal is to not run the show. Let your people run the show, build the systems, build the processes. So if you left for a week on vacation, the business would continue. Your people would do their jobs mm -hmm. and the money would continue to flow. Yeah. That's the overall objective here and what we're trying to build. You then have an asset. Once you have an asset, you can sell it mm -hmm. or you can keep it or you can do whatever you want with it. Or you could take month-long vacations. But the working on side really gets to the point of building that business structure so it could run without you. Yeah. And often the, the concepts aren't too difficult to understand. Like you said, you have the E-Myth and, and this entrepreneurial operating system, the EOS. And it makes a lot of sense. People are, are really excited about it and they start working on their business. I find getting into the implementation is really where, you know, you kind of get stuck in the weeds and, and you can get some hurdles and and where, you know, it, a lot of contractors kind of get a little bit stuck uh, spinning their wheels is, is actually on the implementation of how do I actually use these systems in order to get the results and the benefits of, you know, being able to go on vacation and take some time right. off. So can, can you tell us a bit about your, the, like the map system that, that you've developed and, and that concept and how you use that. So, yeah. That so what I put together, and what I build my, mm -hmm. my training and my course around is what I call the construction business map, which is map stands for money, advertising and production. Now the money side is your accounting income, receivables, payables, you know, everything associated with counting. But these are the three things, the money, the advertising and the production are the three things you need to focus on as a business owner every day. And most guys get stuck on the production side. They, they ignore the other two until they run out of production and then they run over and, and, and do the, the advertising side and try to drum up more work. So I, I kind of set it up as an acronym because I love acronyms and it's easy to follow, but it's it's the business map. So you focus on your money, the advertising. I needed something to build out the ad the acronym, but the advertising reflects that mm -hmm. side of the business, which is your marketing, your sales and getting to contract everything on that side that's associated with advertising your business. And then once that's done, that's a complete and clean handoff to your production side and your production team then goes out and builds the product that you sold. 
And you want to track all of that information, how much money you're spending on subs, materials, how much time you're spending on the job. That flows back up into accounting, and now you're back into the uh, the money side of it. So it is a cycle, and it's a continuous ongoing cycle, mm-hmm. but those are the three key elements business owners need to focus on. Now, that sounds simple. There's a lot of pieces inside each one of those, but the other key I look at when I look at the business map is the three pieces need to talk to each other. As I said, production needs to feed back into accounting. But your accounting should also be collecting massive amounts of data for you so you know where you're making the most money. Well, once you know where you're making the most money, you know where to spend your marketing dollars. That's why we're in businesses to make some money. So if it happens mm-hmm. to be in kitchen renovation or outdoor living spaces, whatever it may be, you focus your marketing dollars in that area. It doesn't mean you can't pick up extra work, but that's mm-hmm. where your money goes because that's where you make the most money. And then you've got to get this clean talk to get that sales side cleanly transitioned into production so you don't have that cross talk back and forth through the whole job what did you mean here what's in the contract what are we building yeah definitely i love how you have it you know it's a cycle you know one feeds the other and like you said it's very important that the different pieces are talking communicating to each other and i've been in in a company where we had that conversation with a client who had in this stage it was like the, the real estate agent kind of sold the the, the project that the home new home and sort of promised a different design and style than was what was actually, you know, the, the builder had agreed to. So, you know, that we had to go through facilitate that conversation of, well, actually what you purchased is this, and it's not the same as maybe what the realtor had showed you. And, you know, so there's definitely some, some hiccups that can happen during the different stages there, as well as, you know, the, can you, can you speak a bit to the, the advertising and sales side of the business? I feel like contractors, a lot of them understand the, the production side. That's, you know, generally where they came up and, and they know that, right. but having like, I think the money and the the advertising sides are, are two kind of new areas for some contractors, or they maybe don't have the the background knowledge, of, you know, from what a lar- how a large business runs in those areas. Right. So Did yeah, and, and 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 I totally agree with you. Totally agree. The, those two elements are some of the biggest challenges, and they're overall they're not that complicated. The biggest challenge, I'll call it, within the advertising side of it, is the marketing piece. What should I do as marketing? Where should I spend my money? Where should I spend my time? And these days, it's a lot of time for the most part. Back in the day, you know, we couldn't afford as as a small company to buy TV ads. They were national. They weren't local. Even if you went with a local TV station, you picked up the state or maybe the three states around you if you lived in the Northeast. So TV wasn't an option. What do I do with this marketing? And how long do I have to market? Well, the answers to that is uh, today it's a lot of time, as I said, because it's social media. It's putting up posts on social media. It's engaging with your potential clients on social media. It's joining the local chamber of commerce or maybe the local you know, service organization like Rotary Club or Lions Club or one of those to be part of the community, even the PTA. Where are your customers? Join those groups. Be involved. You're not there selling, Mm -hmm. you're becoming known because people buy from people they know, like, and trust. And by becoming part of your community and joining these groups, attending the meetings, being part of the fundraiser, you're becoming known, you're becoming liked, and you're becoming trusted. And then they'll go, oh, so what do you do for a living? Oh, well, I was thinking about renovating my kitchen. Isn't that great? Yes, it is. So, but it's an ongoing effort. Marketing never ends. So it feels Mm -hmm. like okay, I did that step, I'll move on. You never move on. You will be part of these groups or part of social media or whatever you're doing forever. And you Mm -hmm. have to accept it as just part of your lifestyle. Like it's got to be something you do as an owner, but you need the time to do these things. And that's why you can't spend all of your day out there in production. You need some time to sit and do a little social media, go to a meeting. You know, yeah, the boss is goofing off. He's at that Rotary Club meeting. No, he's working. Yeah. And marketing is a place where like you, like you mentioned, multifaceted, you want to have multiple different angles because you're going to find things that work really well for you. And that's where you want to double down, but you don't want right. to just have one avenue, like just referrals or just Facebook ads or, or, you know, just a rotary club where you're getting leads from, because if something happens, you know, whatever it is, you want to be, you know, in multiple different areas and each one kind of boost the other one. They see you here, they see you there. You know, it, it builds that trust and likability, as you mentioned. Right. And 
And also as far as the time factor goes, you know, that's a really good opportunity to, to build some systems and some processes. So you're not kind of doing things from scratch and every day trying to think, oh, I need to post something today or what have you, but have, have some sort of, you know, a process there to make it easier for yourself. Oh, absolutely. Um, so yeah. If you're on the job site, just try to remember when you're out there, take some video, take some pictures, show mm -hmm. the folks what's going on. You go, And a lot of it, especially for builders, but I think this happens in a lot of businesses. Yeah. The work we do every day on that production side seems so boring. We know how to do it. Everybody understands this. Nobody wants to know. But I have literally told tile contractors, just do a video of how you cut tile. Yeah. People don't know how tile gets <laughs> cut. They're fascinated by this stuff. You think yeah. it's boring because you've got thousands of tile. You're like, what's the big deal? Yeah. The big deal is people love this stuff, especially, you know, that's why HGTV has a following. Yeah. Show them what you do. Explain to them how the drywall's cut. They don't know. They don't know mm -hmm. how it's finished. You know, yeah. they don't know the, requir the required steps for good prep work on paint. Show them, mm -hmm. show them what you do. Yeah, it's common because you have the knowledge. It just seems every day for you, but lots of people are very interested in that stuff, as, as you mentioned. What what are some mistakes that you see contractors making when it comes to their, their operations and their business? And, and how would you do things differently? The biggest thing is we all start out wearing all the hats. We're a small business. We're entrepreneurs. You know, we set up shop. We are it. Mm -hmm. And too many owners get into the mindset of i have to do it the only way it's going to get done right is if i do it myself and they don't build those systems to help them walk away from certain tasks and even if they built the systems they're not comfortable walking away and they have to understand that yes when you hand this off to other people they're going to make mistakes it's going to happen it's going to be a cost of you doing business it's going to be a cost of your growth but it's also a new opportunity for you to go what part of my systems are not working because if those mistakes happen more than once you know something's broken and you got to go in and fine tune and tweak that process to make sure that it doesn't happen again because every time it happens it's costing you money how do i stop that how do i get better every single day at building out those processes yeah i find a good kind of litmus test is you know new problems are actually good problems you're never going to get away from problems if you're growing and, and you know in business that's just a necessity if you're, if you're dealing with the same problems over and over and over again that's a bad problem that's a problem that right. you need to create a system for and figure out you know go upstream and figure out what what's causing this downstream so with systems what have you found most beneficial or you know how how should contractors approach you know building systems in their business and you're building systems the, the first and easiest step to do is you're already doing all the work. Like I said, you're wearing all the hats. You're doing the accounting. You know, you're doing the estimates. You're writing the sales contracts. You're doing the marketing. Well, what are you doing? Pick mm -hmm. one, whether it's how do I process invoices? You know, and this is the, you know, how, how do I need an elephant? One small bite at a time. So that's why I say, just pick one. Don't turn this into an overwhelming process of, I have got to build systems for my business. But write down, just pick one small task. How, mm -hmm. what are my steps from when I get an invoice in the door? What do I do? And, you know, maybe you get one done a month. Maybe, hopefully, maybe you get the small ones, you get them one done a week and you move on to the next one. Yep. In doing that, two things happen. One, you get the process, but also you start to realize very quickly that that may not be the most efficient process ever. Like I can't really have somebody else do this for me. And that's the goal. You're writing down this process. So you could say, I'm going to hire a bookkeeper and I'm going to tell the bookkeeper, this is how we do it. Could somebody else do that for you? Once you understand the process you're going through, like, yeah, nobody else can do that. So then, you know, it gives you an opportunity to take a harder look at your business all at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah. So great points there for sure. It'll make your life a whole lot easier. Plus you'll figure out, is this really the good process, you know, to, to be doing how, how would you approach them then taking that process and delegating it or, or creating a role so that they can get it off their plate and then have someone else, you know, a lot of this, then creating. it becomes a big part of the job description when you're hiring folks, I've seen the other mistake. A lot of business owners do. They're like, you know, my accounting is all messed up. I got to hire a bookkeeper. Well, the bookkeeper is not going to fix anything. They're going to do their job, whatever they think their job is, but they're not going to fix it because that's not their job. Mm. So by you going in and saying, this, these are my expectations. This is my process of doing bookkeeping. If you see any rooms for improvement, I'd love to hear them, but you need those processes up front. And then that becomes the job description. So the new employee has an expectation of what they're supposed to be doing. You, you, you know, you hear that all the time where it, you know, well, what's really my job here? What did you expect from me? Or you get frustrated as an owner and you let him go and you know, you weren't, you, know, you say, well, you weren't getting anything done. And you're like, I wasn't getting anything done. I, 
I was swamped every day. Well, you didn't get the stuff done I needed done. Well, you never told me what you needed done because there was no process. It wasn't part of their job. They just didn't know. So they stayed busy doing what they thought was important. Yeah, so much to unpack there and, and great like insight of what you mentioned there is you have a new employee coming in and you know you set that culture and there you set them for success based on what you can provide for them as far as systems and processes and this stuff. And it's just such a better experience for someone coming into your business of like, okay, you know, these these people are organized. They have a process for this. This is like, there's obviously going to be things they need to get trained on and it's going to, you know, be some things they don't know how to do, but that whole culture of your business that, you know, there is, you know, we are a, for lack of a better word, legitimate run business right. that, that has, you know, proper systems and onboarding and, and training. And we invest in our people, we invest in our systems and business and stuff like that. So, so yeah, that's just and a lot of culture. times that new employee is actually a great resource because they, they've had different experiences at different businesses. So they, we get trapped in our own little bubble you know we know whatever it may be quickbooks or we know sage 300 or that's what we use that's what we know somebody comes in and goes hey i was working at this last firm and we did this this and this and you're like you've never heard of that what what's that all about yeah. you know and so their past experience is really worth listening to because they may have had exposure to things that we've never even seen mm -hmm. now maybe it doesn't work for us and you go hey i love that but you know maybe that's in the five-year plan but it, it's not going to work today but you've been exposed and you can really start Start thinking about how would that work for me? Yeah, definitely. Like you said, we've kind of grown up in our own businesses as, as contractors and we've built out a business, but often we don't have really like in-depth knowledge of how other businesses or competitors are, are operating and some of the stuff that they're using. So new employees are, are a great way to get a second set of eyes and a different experience set and all that kind of stuff. What's some of the best advice that you've received in your career and, and how did you apply it? Probably I'd say the best I got, and it wasn't really advice, but I, I worked for a gentleman back uh, shortly after college and he was, we, we this was all pre-computer days. That's how old I am. But it was all paper. Mm -hmm. But I would go in and meet with him and I would have my folders all ready and we'd go over the folders. And if they weren't perfect, he'd send me packing. Go back, get them right. Don't waste my time. And he was a stickler for that. And it annoyed me terribly. You know, because I had told the owner, I'll get these to you by the end of the day. And then I had to, you know, hat in hand, go, okay, I'm not going to have them done. Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, because I don't know what my boss's time schedule is. But that taught me some really good lessons about following the process. Do, there was a reason it was done. And by him forcing me to stick with that process and to do it right and not letting me slide going, yeah, 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 you probably got it. There was no yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. the way we do it. And this is the way I want it done. Don't waste my time by coming in here with your work halfway done or 90% done. It's not done. And that attitude towards finishing the work has really stuck with me. Like I said, it wasn't advice, but it was just the way he approached yeah. me and our relationship that really, really stuck with me. Yeah. It's kind of setting the, the bar of, of excellence or of, you know, what's expected expectations and things like that. And I think follow through tenacity, finishing what you start, like great characteristics for any high achiever, anybody that wants to go far is, is you know, sticking with it, getting it done and doing it, you know, pushing yourself to, to be, to get it done at a high level. So great advice there. Contractors, myself included, when I was running my business, we get overwhelmed, you know, <laughs> like you said, wearing all the hats, dealing with, you know, guys and clients and processes and all this stuff. What are kind of three actionable tips that, that contractors could take our listeners could, could do to be better help them, you know, deal with being overwhelmed or stressed? Well, the overwhelm and stress, I say with that, the first thing is don't ever forget about yourself. If you're burned out, if you're working 12, 14, 16 hours a day, if you're working every weekend, you're exhausted. The work you're doing is poor quality work. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your relationships. You're doing this to support your family and to build your family and you're not there. Now, I get it. There's going to be long days. There's going to be deep nights. It's going to happen, but you've got to block some personal time. If that's nothing more than, you know, a two mile walk, take the dog, go for a walk, clear your head, find something you need to take care of yourself before you take care of the business. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that is really important. And in that theme, you need to have the goal to start taking off hats. You know, if you say, okay, I'm wearing all the hats. Okay. 
which is the first it's going to go and then when set those deadlines set those objectives for yourself and say by this time next year i am going to have a bookkeeper full-time on board or i'm going to have a project manager or i'm going to hire my first carpenter or i'm going to hire a marketing team whatever it may be but always be working towards i'm going to take off another hat but then when are you going to take off that hat and be prepared to let go? I like to also know what the role is. That's why I say, you know, you're going to learn how to do bookkeeping. You may not be an accountant, but you're going to understand your books in the process. So when you do hand off these tasks and somebody says, yeah, it took me three hours to input those invoices. If you've been doing that task, you know, it takes three hours. If you've never done it, you might just roll your eyes and go, they're goofing off. That's like a 10 minute job. But by actually doing it, understanding the role before you hand it off, you do know what it takes. You do know the frustrations and the problems that occur during those events. So that handoff becomes easier and you need to step by step, one by one, start taking off the hat, stepping back from the business, having that time to focus on the growth and making money. And the reasons you started your business was to support your family. And I would say number three is learn accounting. Like you don't have to be a bookkeeper, but mm -hmm. accounting is the scorecard of business. That's how yeah. we measure our success. Mm -hmm. You need a good PL statement. You need to understand what it means. You need to know how to read it, every single line in it. Again, you don't have to be a you know a CPA, but you got to know your numbers. You got to know your books. You got to know your job costs. You've got to know what insurance is costing you. You got to know the impact of your overhead on your business. So take the time out, learn the accounting. It's so important. You're running a business now. So what would you say to a contractor who's maybe like they know they need to hire a bookkeeper or get a project manager, but they're, you know, they're just, they're already kind of on the red line as far as finances go. And, and they just don't see a, a way out as far as how they can afford to, to bring on other team members. What, what would be your advice to them or, or the process you would go to, to get them in a better place? I, I love that question. Thanks for asking it. That, that's mm -hmm. one yeah. of my favorites is there are thanks to, we'll, we'll, we'll give thanks to COVID, but the explosion of this, where we can have a conversation remotely with a video call. This is part of our society, part of our lives now. So remote working has become a huge benefit to contractors. Now, most contractors think that's impossible in my business. I need carpenters on site, but you don't need a bookkeeper sitting in the desk next to you. My bookkeeper is in Arizona. She's been with me, I don't know, seven years. Never met her. I've never even been on a Zoom call with her. I couldn't spot her on the street. She has access to my QuickBooks online. She does. She enters all of my invoices. She balances all of my accounts. She gives me a report at the beginning of every month. She pays me for the time she works on my, or I pay her for the time she works on my business alone. I don't know how many customers she has. She's a stay-at-home mom. She works on it when she can, but she's diligent and it gets done in the time I need it done. So you can hire people remotely. You can hire a part-time project manager, a, a stay-at-home mom again, who's got four hours a day when the kids are at school that could be doing project management for you, or a bookkeeper who, you know, maybe used to be a CPA and now is a stay-at-home mom and would love to just fill some of the afternoon, make a few extra bucks, staying involved in the industry and doing your books for you. You don't have to hire full-time and have all that overhead, rent the offices, have the computers, all the stuff that goes along with hiring an employee. You don't have to do that these these days this can be done remotely yeah definitely and you don't need you know a full-time or, or dedicated person for you know even an admin position there's there's a lot of these these tasks that you can slowly get off your plate you know bookkeeping is kind of i would not like a big one but it's it's one of the big parts of a business that definitely if, if you're still running your books look at getting a bookkeeper it's it's something that you can pay someone who's probably better at it probably knows more more about it for a lot less than than what your you know rate would be as a business owner doing you know some of the higher level right Right. Function, and you'd be far better stuff. spending your time doing a social media post than you are entering invoices. Let somebody yeah. else enter the invoices. You work on marketing. Marketing that can bring in, you know, tens, hundreds, million dollars, you know, depending on your business size of a business. Right. Um, so, so definitely. Can you run us through a success story of a client of yours, of kind of where they started, some of the challenges they had and, and the work that you did to help them? Yeah. Um, one, one of my favorites is I've got a small contractor in the Northeast and I say small, he was doing about 800,000 a year. He's taking over the business from his father. His father was still in the business, but his father basically ran the business as a gentleman builder. You know, he was a one man show and he was fine with that. He just, you know, built stuff but the son joined in and he was like i don't want this as my career i love construction but i want this to be a business 
So I joined them early on as they were getting this stuff set up. And within two years, we had him up to doing $3.2 million in total revenue with some really nice, healthy profits. And it's been a phenomenal growth for them. He is now in that hiring stage. He is looking for a bookkeeper and a project manager to start offloading some of these tasks. Because when I met him, he was tool belt on every day. We had to meet at seven o'clock in the morning because he needed to get on the job site. He doesn't go on job sites anymore. And a recent call, he complained, how do I get out to the job so I can see what's going on and meet with my people? I don't have time anymore to get out there. And part of that is he needs to start offloading now is some of the other hats. He's got to get rid of the bookkeeping. He's got to get some of the project management off his desk so he can see the work that's going on in the field. He can't interact with his people. So it's just been a joy working with them. They, they are dedicated to building a business, which just makes me look good because they have the right attitude going in. But mm -hmm. their success, their growth has been just, it's been a joy to me and I ho hopefully to them as well to see how, how far they've come in a few short years. Yeah, great to hear that. And a good you know type of client who's got a bit of fire in the belt. And, and really wants to make things happen and you know when you've got a coach it's just like you know adding gasoline or whatever and just just gets you there that much quicker you know that's a pretty good good growth curve that, that you mentioned there can you is there anything you can attribute to that or any specific kind of key milestones that that they accomplished on the way to, to help facilitate that growth well a couple of things one is he had the advantage that his dad stayed in the field so he had somebody to cover the production side of it. Uh, his wife has a marketing background, so she helped him out with marketing. But the thing we also then focused on on the backside of marketing was learning how to sell, having a sales script, knowing what you're doing when you go in. We switched him over to being a full design build company. And so now when he goes on sales calls, he's not selling a $100,000 kitchen. He's selling a $1,500 pre-construction agreement. Mm -hmm. Much easier to sell. He goes on that sales call with the contract in hand, walks out with a signed contract and a deposit check. Not walking out with a set of plans and two more weeks worth of work in front of him to prepare an estimate. So we really worked hard on revamping his sales process, how he brings in customers. And I think he's at a, like a 95% of those pre-construction customers become construction clients. Some fall off for various reasons. He also has the opportunity to go, you know what? Those people are crazy. I don't really want to build their house. I don't want to stick with these people for another six months. Here's yeah. your estimate. Here's your plans. Have a good life. So mm -hmm. he, it gives him an opportunity to measure the customer as well. So yeah. getting better at selling has really mm -hmm. helped them sell more work. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And I love it when you dive a little deeper, it often comes down to the team. You know, no one does everything by themselves. And generally, if you see someone that's very, quite successful, it's because they've got a lot of support and a, and, a, and a good team behind them that they're, you know, helping to to grow the business with and then the sales process is very interesting and i create one for design well, i mean design build lends itself naturally into that you know pre-construction agreement and you know selling them on you know a smaller thousand to three thousand dollar design pre-construction you know agreement where the client doesn't have to doesn't have the risk of you know signing for whatever fifty thousand hundred thousand whatever you know project they can get the designs they can work with the contractor and generally through that relationship it's you know it's very easy then to move that that into you know the the sales side of actually landing the right. project yeah I, I the design build from that standpoint i mean purely helps the client and, and it works even if they have an architect that the architects the three bid process does not work in construction and it really doesn't work in residential construction but everybody does it because they think that's the way it needs to be done this is a team effort between the owner the builder and the architect and you've got to involve all three people in that design process so you're work you're designing to a budget mm -hmm. and the contractor knows the price that you need them on the team and when you're over budget and you're looking for an alternative yeah. the contractor is going to be the one that goes you know what we did this on another job it worked out really great it cost half the half the amount of money are you interested in looking at trying to do it this way mm -hmm. Well, that's a win for everybody. And when you get to the end, you have a clean scope of work for the budget that the owner was anticipating. Yeah, there's going to be changes. There always are. But, you know, not, you know, I signed it for 100,000 and it was 200,000 when I was done. You know, no, it's going to be more like I signed it for 100,000 and we picked the nicer tile. And by the time we were done, we were at 108. Well, that's the kind of job you want. And you walk away with friends 
not enemies, and it's a collaborative effort. And, and it, it, it's custom all the way. So treat it as a full team. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're going to continue the conversation, but for, for people out there that want to connect with you, what's what's the best way for them to connect with you? Well, obviously, we've got all, we've all got websites. So I'm www.businessblueprintinc.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. I post regularly on LinkedIn. My full bio is on LinkedIn. Anything you want to know about me is there. I respond quickly if you have any questions or anybody can just reach out to me. I, I love to have calls. I love to talk to other builders, meet other builders. Sometimes we get on a discovery call. It's not a good fit, but I give them a couple of tips on you know what they could do over the next few months to help out their business. Maybe we have a connection in a couple of years. Maybe we don't, but I love to meet new builders. I like to hear their challenges for me in my social media world. A lot of those conversations will become a social media post. I don't mention names, but mm -hmm. they do become social media posts because I get to see new challenges challenges that the industry is experiencing. Yep. Definitely. It's a great way to, to produce content for contractors out there. If you have clients that are asking questions about, you know, how does, what's the schedule like, or how's the process or how much is it going to cost? Like use any kind of challenges or questions or, you know, things from day to day. And those are always great, great posts and content because people are interested in that and they want to know. About right. It. So yeah, they don't know. Great. I mean, how many people buy construction and how often will they do it in their life? You know, maybe 10% of people buy construction. Maybe they'll of those 10%, maybe half of them will buy twice. This is not a repeat. So people don't know how to buy construction. Yeah, Educate definitely. them. Mm -hmm. Tell them about the process. You know, we all know how to buy gasoline. We've learned how. We mm -hmm. know how to run the pump, but we don't know how to buy construction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where we can take the opportunity to educate potential clients, the consumers as a whole. You know, this is how it works. It's not like buying gasoline. You don't just go out and yep. turn on the pump there, and fill your... There's been a big shift towards that over the years of, you know, educational marketing and, you know, you provide stuff people want to hear about and things that are interesting to them and, and educate them on the construction process. And it's a great way to to be, you know, looked as the expert and we'll search and, and find you and things like that. So uh, any, any last words of wisdom or ideas that, that you'd like to share? Uh, wisdom and ideas. I don't know. I feel like I've got a lot more wisdom over the ages, given my experience, but it's hard to sum it all up. I would say probably for entrepreneurs, small businesses, it's overstated, but consistency. You've just got to be consistent in everything you do. If you're doing marketing, it's not a one shot deal. You've got to be yeah. consistent. You've got to be consistent in your sales process. You've got to be consistent in getting up every day and motivating the team. Everything in this is consistency and having a process. You can't wait until you you feel like doing it. You can't wait till you're motivated to do it. You've just got to be consistent in doing the tasks that need to get done. Yeah, for sure. Sticking with it, finishing it, like you mentioned earlier on, that's what's going to make you successful over the years. You know, it may, it may feel like a sprint day to day, but it's definitely, you know, it's a marathon. It's a marathon. Uh, and it, yeah. Having that vision and that end goal and just day in, day out, sticking with it and, and moving forward is what will bring success. So I want to thank you so much for coming on here, Dwayne. Uh, it's been a pleasure. No, thanks for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun and I appreciate it.